that's a different view. <laughs> hey Robot Makers, how are you doing? Hope you're having a good day so far. So do you want to know about Grafana uh, for creating dashboards for all your data from Internet of Things? Uh, do you want to see my setup and how I've got everything configured? Then this is the show for you. So let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin. Come with me as we build robots, I bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, let me get over to my slide deck and we can uh, make a start. Okay, so yeah, we're going to be having a look at my Grafana dashboard setup and how I've got this configured with Node-RED. We'll have a quick uh, tour of Grafana, how it works and so on, what it can do, what it's used for, and then I'll show you my setup, um, which is configured using Docker. Um, and then we'll have a bit of a play, uh, a bit of a demo. So, And then, of course, we'll have the live stream Q&A, which is what it's all about. So what is it got Grafana? What can it do? So Grafana, and I hope I'm pronouncing it the way everybody else pronounces it, is a free open source data visualization and monitoring tool. It allows you to create and share dashboards, alerts, and graphs for various different data sources, such as databases, web services, and cloud services. I pretty much use it with InfluxDB. We'll have a look at how all that works in a minute. So Grafana can be used to monitor and analyze system performance. Uh, a software company I used to work for, they use Grafana quite a bit to uh, to grab data from, um, or what was the Stats D, I think this service was called, that basically just produce statistical data uh, from all their so source code software. And uh, yeah, basically just spit these things out. This would then collect it, and then they could see if there was any sort of issues there uh, from a performance perspective. So you can get, yeah, you can track business metrics, gain insights into data trends and anomalies. It's very easy to use once you get the hang of it. I would say there's a bit of a hang of it uh, to be got as well. So what does it not do? So it doesn't actually store any data itself. All it does is uh, connects to data sources and then sort of queries them. And it displays mostly time-based data. We'll have a look at exactly how this works in a second. Um, but yeah, it's mostly time-based data. Things like temperature readings, that's pretty much what I would use it for, sort of sensor data. Um, and it displays this time-based data in these lovely graphs and charts, and there's all different kinds of options that you have there for that. And you can rapidly slice the time-based data to get to just the data that you're interested in. So you can look at a month's view, a year's view, or, you know, the past 10 seconds, depending on how often your data is refreshed. Uh, and you can build these visual visualizations with queries. We'll certainly dive into some of the queries. And you can manage the user access to the dashboard. So you could have a master dashboard and you could have like uh, different access levels to that depending on who the person is who's reading it. Um, so what I use it for myself, so I use it to display all the weather data that we have from the weather station. So just outside in the robot lab, just behind Alex there, there's a weather station, which is the uh, the Pimroni weather station. I think that's running on the um, the weather hat. Um, there is also a, a, an Enviro weather as well, which uses the same sensors. And it's got the uh, anemometer, which is the, uh, <laughs> it tells you how fast the, uh, the wind is spinning. We have the... Uh, um, What's it called? The weather vane, which tells you the uh, the direction of the wind that it's travelling in, and you also got the rain sensor as well. And I think there's also like a temperature sensor, humidity, pressure, that kind of thing as well. I've also got a couple of extra sensors. Um, I'm not sure if I've got these to hand actually, but there is a CO2 sensor that I have, uh, which obviously detects CO2 levels, and um, I have lots of these Philips Hue lights, and the Philips Hue light sensor, the door sensor has built into it uh, a temperature, pressure, humidity sensor. So you can actually get all those bits of data just by adding an extra plug into something like Node-RED and then you can surface all the extra data as well as light levels, of course. I've also got the um, uh, another sensor over there, which is the, um, the Enviro Plus which is another Pimroni product, and that one enables you to take really um, accurate readings from particulate data. So you can look at NOx levels, VOC, volat volatile organic compounds, other types of particulates, dust, smoke, and so on. Um, and I've also got a number of the um, Enviro indoor and urban sensors as well as that, which uh, also do the same thing. So in that video we just show showed before this live stream, uh, if you've not seen that, we'll go and check it out. That's all about the uh, how to make your own self-watering plant system. That one has a, a shot of the indoor sensor that I have, which is the Enviro indoor for all just temperature, pressure and so on. And that's in a different room in the house. So I've got these throughout the house uh, and also in the, uh, the robot lab as well. So all that data has just been spitted out from these little internet of things and it's been collected and we'll have a look at how all that all matches together. I also use this for data from robotic projects as well. So if I've got a robot and it's measuring distance, I can simply just capture that um, Basically, if it's, if it's spitting the data out to an MQTT broker, which most of my projects do, then you can collect that data, 
put it into InfluxDB and then visualize it in Grafana. So this is the kind of thing that I use it for all the time. So this is how my setup works. So we have our little um, sensor on the left hand side there that's going to send its raw data to MQTT. And when I say raw data, it doesn't really matter what format that's in. We can manipulate that within Node-RED most of the time. Um, so it transmits that data over Wi-Fi to an MQTT broker. So that is currently sat on, um, I think, my uh, Raspberry Pi 400, which is just on my desk here. That does all the sort of master work, that one. Uh, and that's got an MQTT broker on it, and it has a, a fixed IP in a Docker container. Uh, so I can spin up that container on any of the machines, and it'll always get that same IP address. And that um, simply just captures the data and then passes it on to anybody that's subscribed to that topic. So very, very straightforward. Uh, I then have um, another uh, node which is running in Docker on a different machine. This is running on uh, machine number three, which is behind me in that little cluster of uh, Raspberry Pis just there. Uh, so the third machine there has Node-RED running on it. Node-RED uh, connects to this MQTT broker. It can read all those messages that are coming in and it can do things with them. And it's really nice, the interface, to how you can manipulate the data in there. So we have had quite a few shows on Node-RED in the past. We'll have a quick look at how that data comes in and then we'll see how we can then spit that out into InfluxDB, and InfluxDB is the time-based data uh, database that we have. That's also running on um, a Docker container. That's running on the Raspberry Pi 400, which is just to my left here. Uh, and that essentially just records the data to its, uh, its internal database. And then in, a th in another data, in another container, another Docker container, we have Grafana installed. And that's the thing that will visualize the data. We'll connect to that. Um, and then configure things like the data source, which is our influx DB. So it's kind of a pipeline. Uh, the data comes from the raw raw source from the sensor, which can be anywhere in the property. It then gets sent to the MQTT broker. That then passes it on to things that are subscribed to it, one of which is the Node-RED um, instance. Node-RED then can manipulate that data, tidy up the data so it's in the right format, enhance the data by adding extra tags to it. So for example, uh, one of the temperature sensors I might have doesn't have the location tagged to it. So what I can do is I can say, if the data comes from this particular sensor, add the room um, tag to it. And I'll show you how to do that too. Uh, that then gets passes that data into InfluxDB, which stores it internally, and then Grafana points at InfluxDB to do all its graphs. So very nice and simple. And all of these containers are actually built using Ansible, which is a, uh, an automation tool. Um, I think it's written in Python as well. And um, Ansible can send out a script to say, on that particular machine, run this Docker container, bring it up, and then let it uh, do what it needs to do. So it means I can tear all this down, build it all up very, very easily, very quickly. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the Raspberry Pis that are just behind me there that run kevsrobots.com, they get rebuilt uh, pretty much every night. So it's uh, pretty quick, pretty seamless. So let's have a look at some of the uh, the Node-RED flows that I have. So let me get over, I'll just uh, bring the right screen on here. So let me just bring up this one and then I can share that with you. So if I go over here, here we go. So this is Node-RED, and this is where the data comes in um, using these MQTT input nodes. So let me show you what they look like. So you, you basically just drag these little components out onto this sort of canvas area. You double click them to configure them. And um, you can see that I've got like cheer lights, MQTT. Um, I've got my local um, um, MQTT broker, which is this 192.168.1.5 two which is um, a local one and the cheer lights one is one that's actually on the internet and we can grab data from that to see what the current color is for example so if we leave that uh, excuse me cheer lights one there what i'm going to do is i'm just going to unplug this uh this debug node here and i'm just going to connect them together i love how it does this they're like little noodles and you can connect them together just like that now when you move them about it sort of uh, moves the noodle about as well really love how that works Right, so what I've got coming from the MQTT, so let's just say, um, shouldn't really do this, but hash just means give me absolutely everything. So I'm just going to get say give me everything from that node. And then when I click on deploy, it's now going to run that uh, particular um, uh, flow. These are called flows. So if I just clear out all the data from there, and let's see what appears in here. If there's any, um, do I need to, to poke that somehow? I know with the cheer lights one, you have to sort of prompt it to send you data. Um, so that's probably not actually going to work in that case. So what I'll do, I'll just delete that one. 
What I have got though is I've got um, a piece of software running. I'm just going to connect that up to there like so. Click on deploy and this is going to get some data every couple of seconds. You can see there it's saying Enviro grow um, and object object. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to disconnect that from here. I'm going to plug it into, this is a debug node, this green thing. And we kind of can see the outputs of what's going on on that from that particular node there on the right hand side, just where I am. So if I just delete all that, click on deploy. You deploy like the latest release of this each time you change it. So you can see there the grow hat is sending out this data here. It's sending out this nickname, Enviro stub, timestamp, and then there's a timestamp that's going up every second. Readings, and that's um, an array of temperature, which is 25, humidity, 90, pressure, whatever that is, luminance, the light levels, and then moisture A, B, and C. Now, this is actually a bit of a cheat. I've actually got um, a piece of code running here, which is like stub code. So when, sometimes when I'm building something, I'll create something that will have the same output as the actual device will do once it's running. So because my um, Enviro Grow died, I've not got this to be able to actually send any data out. Um, so this piece of code here simulates that. It actually borrows the code from, uh, from the Enviro Grow, and it simply just gets some random data. Um, so you can see that it's just getting random integers between two values but that just gives us something to capture and then store somewhere else so that's running in the background at the moment and if I go back over to here we can see that coming through there so currently that's not very nicely formatted um, if we tried to put that into um, InfluxDB it won't really know what to do with it so what we can do is we can convert that into JSON data so instead of it uh, we just move that to there remove that one so this json node is simply going to convert between json strings and like local objects as uh, as it sees them so let me say done to that deploy this let's now just delete this and now we can see we've got this nicer looking um, thing here where it's got the name the object and it's in different coloring it knows that these are dates it knows there's a, a readings object and inside that readings object there's various different temperature humidity pressure and so on all nicely formatted because it understands that so that means that we can take that raw data we can make it json just by adding the json node and that's just simply one of these extra i think it was just there wasn't it uh, there we go you just drag these parsers out and then you can basically just join them together with a noodle so that's all that that does there the other thing I've got here, this um, this uh, changeover thing, let me just find that on here. So I think that's, um, da, 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 da. let me find that. There we go, change. So this change node, if I double click on that, we can change messages that are within what they call the payload. So the payload is, is that thing you can see on the right hand side there. That's the sort of payload of data. It doesn't really care how it's formatted, but in this change node, you can actually go in there and add in individual things. So you can say, um, add a value, like change a value, um, search for like location, um, change it to like my location, something like that. Oops. And if it finds that, it'll change that, that, that for example. And you can delete particular things, you can move them, you can do all kinds of different things. So let's just... Uh, remove those for a minute so that's what the the change object does and in this one here I'm simply setting the location to be uh, say simply we're sim simply setting the message.payload.location to summer house so setting it creates it if it doesn't exist uh, and that means that I can then say that this data that's coming from this grow hat is from the summer house location now one of the challenges I came up against with this is this readings object that's uh, within here this that sort of nested within it influx didn't like this if you try and write that data out to influx you'll get an error message so let me show you what i mean so if we take that influx node there so this this is the output going to our influx database if i take that data and i just oops and i just shove it in there like so and i then just deploy that let me just get rid of any messages. We'll see we get these like error 400, a bad request occurred. And that's because it doesn't know how to parse that data that's nested within this the thing. So we need to split it out. Now there's probably a better way of doing this, but the way I've discovered to do it, I'm just gonna move that over there. Let's just add that to there again. Oops, add that to there and then get rid of that one. There we go, and then deploy that. Heating all those error messages. 
So what we can do in here, we can actually say um, set the the message dot so message dot payload dot moisture b to the value that is in message dot readings dot moisture b, and I've kind of done this for each of them. So moisture a moisture b, um, and then there's a whole load of other ones such as the luminance levels, the pressure, the humidity. You can see what I'm doing there. I'm just getting rid of the readings thing, uh, and then I think at the end do I get rid of it? Yes, yeah, I say delete payload dot readings because we've copied everything at that point. So that kind of splits all the values out individually, kind of flattens them out. And then the last thing that I do, um, in Grafana, you can have um, extra um, dimensions or categories of things. And the way that you do that is you split your data into an array. So you can have the first thing, which is the, your actual readings, the actual data you want. So message.payload is in array one. And then array two, we're adding in some extra tags, such as the location, summer house, and the sensor is Enviro Grow. And then what we then say is the payload then becomes equal to an array of those two arrays. And then we return that sort of packaged up thing. And when we send that, um, let me move this back over here and connect that back up. You'll see we get um, two objects every time we, uh, we get a message. So let's just delete that. And you'll see that we get object, object. And if we open up those two objects, you get the readings there with everything flattened out. And you also get the... Um, the location as well, which um, if I can grab one of these before they fly by and open up um, object one and two, let me just try and do that here. The second one is location, summer house and sensor in Viral Grow. So it means we can have lots of sensors in the same location. We can sort by them and we can also sort by the locations themselves and sort of drill into where the different things are. So there we go. And you can see as I'm hovering over these different messages, you get that little red outline as well. So depending on which node is uh, is active there, you can also add in things like um, comments. So I've decided this little comment there just to say this is the automated plant watering system. And we can do other things as well. We can get data from Google Sheets. We can output to Google Sheets if we wanted to just by just by plugging this in. So this particular one, I think I added in um, just by going to the uh, palette and then you can say install extra plugins. So the nodes I've got currently installed, I've got Node-RED, I've got Google Sheets, I've got Hue Magic, which is all the Philips Hue Lite stuff, the InfluxDB node, and the, the Node-RED dashboard, which I'm not actually using in this particular scenario. So that's one flow, and we've got all these different flows at the top here. So I've got one for my weather station. You can see this one here. Uh, we grab a timestamp, and then we get the temperature from the loft, from the hall, from the bedroom, and from the weather hat itself. We then set the location of each of these. We then add the, um, you can see how I've added the sort of stages. So we add the location, we split that into the different parts for InfluxDB for filtering, and then we save it to InfluxDB. So let's have a look at this InfluxDB node. So we just need to tell it what the server is. So if I just go in there and edit that, you can see I've given it a name, given it a version, given it the host and the port number, and that's the standard port for, uh, for InfluxDB 886. And then you can create a database. You just give it a name and it will automatically create that. In this case, because it's local, I've not put any sort of password um, stuff on there. So it'll just take the data um, without any kind of configuration. So that's how that works. And you can see there the measurement. So this is separate from the database name. The measurement is called weather on that particular flow. If I go back to my Hue, my Enviro Grow and click on here, I created another measurement. And these are like tables. So if the database name um, is the database name is called weather, then the table within that database is called Enviro Grow. And you can have as many of these as you like. So I did this just to separate out the data. Uh, it doesn't really matter when you filter it you can pick and choose uh, where you get your data from so that's my weather station that's my hue sensors so i've got all these front door sensors um again we, we take some other data i've got this um mini weather station um what else am i doing there so yeah basically just taking you know is the front door what what's the temperature from the front door sensor and what's the light level from the the, the front door sensor so we can get all that as well. So if I just delete that, let's see if there's any data coming from this particular flow. Um, yep, we're getting some there. So we can see there, this isn't, um, which one is that connected to? So that one's down there. So that's the weather hat data. So let me see if there's any other. I'm gonna mute that one. You can just click this little button here 
and that will mute that from appearing in this debug window on the right hand side. Let me, uh, let me just delete that again. You can also say debug from the current flow, all nodes, which and there's a lot, or just like currently selected nodes, and you can pick and choose which you want to see. Uh, but it just helps when you're debugging this. So that's the uh, the, the hue sensors. We've seen the uh, Enviro Grow. There's an Enviro Hat one as well. So the Enviro Plus and the Living Room Enviros that they're all getting data. They're all putting them into InfluxDB. I think into the weather as well. And I've got a subscriber count one. So what I've done on here is I've basically just created a slash subscriber uh, MQTT topic and um, this can then push that out. And what I was thinking here, I've got a script in Python that will get the current subscriber number uh, from YouTube and then it can just publish that out and keep publishing out the same number, even though it only has to ask for it once, say once per hour, <laughs> however often I want to grab that. And then I can get something like a, um, a Pimeroni um, Galactic Unicorn, Cosmic Unicorn, something like that, and display that data scrolling across there. So that's what that particular channel is for there. I need to bring that one back up. I've not used it for a while. There's a bathroom one, bathroom fan and bathroom mirror. Um, they have these things called birthing messages. <laughs> it sounds quite odd thing to have there, but essentially like when the thing switches on, you can say, send it to this uh, particular value. Um, so for the fan, we've simply got an on off button as well. So I can turn the bathroom fan on or off just by pressing these little buttons here. And it'll just send a zero or a one. And I've got one of the very first projects I ever made um, was with a, a Sonoff, which I've got one of these in my drawer somewhere. And the Sonoff is just like a little software on off. I'm not sure I put that now actually, to be fair. It's just a little box that has um, an ESP. ESP8286, I think it is, um, and it can get mains in and mains out, and it can basically switch that mains on or off. And I, I flashed um, some C pro, uh, programs to this that I'd written. Um, I, if I was to do it now, I'd basically flash it with MicroPython. But this thing is flawless. It just works. It's been in the loft for a couple of years now, doing what it needs to do. And it simply just listens to that topic, and if the topic says one, it turns the fan on. If it says zero, it turns the fan off. Uh, and that's it. We have a similar one for the, the mirror in the bathroom as well. Uh, I've got another one for BurgerBot. So I can make BurgerBot turn left, right, stop. Um, and then I can actually look at these. So I was saying before about we're not using the dashboard um, in this particular project. This one, if we, if we look at these, we can actually bring up the dashboard. Let me see if I can find that on here, dashboard. Uh, if I click on that link there, I think it should actually open up that dashboard. So you can see there, I can control BurgerBot just by by adjusting these two little sliders. And that's all part of um, Node-RED's functionality. That's the dashboard thing there. And if we go back to the uh, the debug there, you, you you might be able to see some of the readings if I put them to the, to the debug of all the different things that have been slid about there. So if I put that up to the debug and that one as well, and I just click deploy, and then I go back to that dashboard and I just move these about a bit. And I go back to that flow there. Interesting, we don't actually see the, the readings there. It's not logging them out as uh, data. But yeah, that's how that works. Um, and then I've got things like robot control. So that's another motor left, motor right thing with a dashboard of its own. And I've even got 3D printing status. If my 3D printers are switched on, um, I can get all the Octoprint um, data going to here as well so potentially i could have a little remote screen that shows me the current percentage complete of a particular print that's going on uh, i've got one for going out to google sheets appending to a little google sheet uh, and what else we've we got on here so we've got some enviro sensors and we've got chair lights as well of course so we can bring in the current chair light color and um, we can then just echo that out here as well so that's my node red setup. And like I said, the way that I installed this was via an Ansible script, which will connect to the Raspberry Pi, tell it to build a container, and it gets all the instructions to build that container from GitHub. So there's a GitHub repository called Clustered Pi that has all these things in it. And uh, how to build this node red instance is one of the instructions that it has there. So it can do that very, very easily, quickly. So that is my node red setup. Let me just jump back to um, the screen here. I will now have a look at my weather station dashboard. So we're going to do this in Grafana. 
So let me just jump back over to to the browser. So over here, I've got another tab. So this is connected to that uh, 1.3, which is that little Raspberry Pi just in that uh, box behind me there. And this is what it looks like when you sort of launch Grafana. But the very first time you launch it, it'll ask you for like an admin password uh, and so on. But when you very first set it up, this is pretty much what you have here. So you've got things like you can search all your dashboards, you can create dashboards. We'll do that in a second. You can look at your existing dashboards. You can explore. Um, you can set up alerts. I've actually not set the alerts up yet for that. And this is something I would like to do. So what we could do, for example, is have this uh, this data coming from my um, plant system that's just over here behind me. So this uh, this is going to be just over there in the window. But these are the, the new plants that I've uh, created, these little plant pots and the little temperature sensor, the moil sensors, moil? <laughs> moisture sensors for the soil. Let me just put one of these in here to show what that looks like. Uh, so these sort of connect in there. They're quite stable because there's a little uh, thing that they slot into there. And then that's the water inlet there as well. So there's a, a tube that connects to the to the water inlet. Um, just sort of plugs into the end like so. So once I've got the uh, the temp the soil humidity sensors, soil moisture sensors, uh, once I've got that data, if that goes below say twenty percent, so the plant's quite dry, I would wouldn't it to alert me, and I can then send that out as an alert and even have it pop up on my phone as a uh, as a text message, for example. Uh, okay, so let's get back to um, over here. So that's the um, the alerts. We've then got things like data sources, which we'll need to set up to connect to uh, the Influx database. And then we've got things like user management. So I think there's only like two users on here. So let's have a look at the data sources. So you can connect all kinds of data sources to Grafana. There's, there's so many different data types that you can connect to. All the common ones, they've got things like Mongo. They've probably got Redis in there as well. We've got um, Splunk. Postgres, MySQL, or MySQL, Influx, which is what we're using now, and Prometheus. And there's even more you can search for and add in if they, they don't exist. So we're going to set up the Influx database, and we simply just say, what is the URL of the server that we want to connect to? So in our case, it was, um, was it uh, 1.10, I think? Uh, and then we can say what if there's any... Um, authentication required we can fill out all those and then if there's any custom uh, headers as well so once we've filled out all that information we can then set up and test so let me jump back to that one that we've uh, we've got there here so you can see there there you go 1.10.8086 um, I've not got any credentials set up on that one and then we can say save and test and we can see there data source is working and the database that we're connecting to is called weather uh, so there we go so let's have a look at some dashboards. I'll show you the, my existing dashboards and then I'll show you how to create um, a new one. So my weather station dashboard looks a bit like this. This uh, air quality sensor looks like it's gone offline. I think that's uh, one of the ones that's outside that was running on a battery. So I'll probably just need to change the uh, the two AA batteries for that. But we can see there the the gas levels. We can see the uh, the wind speed currently. We can see the, the dew point. Uh, we can see the maximum in the last hour and then the average speed of the wind as well. Uh, what else have we got? If I just move me out of the way for a second. We've also got um, the light levels in Lux. We've got um, the different humidity levels. So the living room is very humid, it says there. Summer house is not very humid, and that's because we have an air conditioner which dries the air out. And then the loft, which is sort of in between. And then we've got the different temperatures. So the loft is 15 degrees. The summer house is 22.7. Not sure how accurate that is. I've got a big thermometer in front of me and that says it's about 16 degrees. And on my air conditioning control, it says set to 18 degrees. So um, it's trending a bit hotter there. It's probably Alex underneath it being <laughs> making it warm. Uh, and then we have things like the pressure levels. We've got the light levels. You can see there when I switch the light on, what time would that have been? So about, yeah, when we came into this, about seven something or other, the light levels have gone up. Uh, oh, I'm not sure that's coming. Oh, that's coming from the living room. So that means the lights have gone in on the living room. And there's a rain sensor and we've got the various different temperature sensors uh, as, as a chart as well as a, um, a little gauge. And then we've got some other ones down here like wind speed, humidity, oxidization, ammonia, which is from the uh, Enviro uh, sensor, which isn't working at the moment. And then we've also got uh, another... It's another gas sensor there. 
Um, so there are all the different things and each one of these you can sort of click into um, you just you can click on the panel and view that sort of zoomed in and um, you can zoom back and you can also on here change the the time frame that you're looking at so if we say show me the last hour look how quickly updated that it's sort of in real time show me last three hours now the further you go back this is running on a raspberry pi so if you go back like a month it takes a little while to grab that data uh, and crunch it we can see there you can see there's a tiny little slice missing there and that's because um at midnight each evening i think the uh the uh, things reboot but that's only the last six hours so let's go for the last two days and it smoothed them out in fact so downward pressure means that you're going to get like a storm so that indicates that we are heading towards a storm potentially uh, and you can see the different gas levels there as well you can see the change of things and we can see there was a bit of rain as well which is correct yesterday and uh, there's the wind speed it doesn't get too too bad where we are positioned here so yeah, that's how we uh, we can configure that. We just drop that down and then we can select the time period or you can actually get really granular and say, I want it between that date and that date there, for example, and uh, it'll apply that time range to the data. So really nice to, to lay these out. Um, you can refresh it right away if that's something that you want to do. Uh, and once you've changed anything, you can just save the dashboard by clicking that. I'm just gonna leave it as it is. So let's create a new dashboard and let's add a new panel to this dashboard and this is where we get into how we can actually set up a query so if, we, if i go into um, the from we're going to select the weather or let's in fact let's select the one that we're running from our python script which is the enviro grow and then when we set those two arrays before which were things we could filter by location or sensor we can then select that particular sensor such as the enviro grow or we could select the location being the summer house for example the robot lab Next, we can select what value we want to to chart. So, for example, if we want to chart, uh, let's have a look the luminance level. We can do that. Uh, let's, in fact, get um, let me find something that it's going to be happy with. That's moisture A. So that really should start appearing on there. Now, the fact it's not suggests to me um, that something is not it's not happy somewhere so what I'm going to do I'm actually going to change my script slightly so that uh, we can filter on this so let me just find the bit that tells us so the mod environment let's change the nickname perhaps live stream let's call it that and let's rerun this let's just stop it and then run it again so because this is sending out data every second, we can very quickly um, go back and change that. So if I now go over here and I look for, let's just remove these filters and add, you can see that the data is actually coming in there now. So I'll leave that there. We don't need to, to go any more granular than that. And we can choose the different, so we've got one moisture level there. And this little alias at the bottom, this is what we want to name this thing, because otherwise it's just got this Enviro Grow mean, which is the, the way that it's grouping together the data. So let's call this one um, Moisture A, like so. And it's time-based, and the, the grouping is, we're grouping it by time. So what we're actually seeing on screen here is representative of the change of data over time. Uh, and that's what it means by the grouping level. So what we can do now as well, we can change the title of the panel, which is up here. So let's just call this um, soil moisture. Uh, let's just apply that. You can see there, soil moisture, and we've got moisture A as one reading on there. And we can resize this just by dragging that sort of corner, or we can move it around depending on where we want to. And there's kind of like little tiles that it sticks to. And that makes it sort of align all the different panels nicely. So we can actually go back in there and edit it again. And we can add further queries. So we've got query A there. If I click on this button here, we can do another query. Um, so we can get that uh, Enviro Grow. We can get the Moisture B. There's Moisture B. Let's just call this one Moisture B. Save that. And these are kind of overlaying a little bit, so it's a bit tricky to see what's going on there. We can zoom in just by sort of drawing a, a bounding box around them. We can see their moisture A, moisture B, and their values between 0 and 100 for the moisture level. 
and we can go back in there and we can add like a third one which is moisture C so let's just do that so measuring the Enviro Grow the field data is called moisture C and we can just call that moisture C okay so there we've got a bit of a mess of data. Now that doesn't look very easy to, to understand what's going on there because everything's sort of too squished together. So we can go back in there and we can have a look down here and uh, make this make more sense. So currently we've got a zero to hundred, but we don't know what that means. What, what um, unit of measure are we using? So we can go over here to the standard options. We can click on what we want this to be and we can just type in like percent and there we go, miss percentage. And that's now added a little percentage sign to those to make that make more sense. And the other thing we can do, we can we can start to play around with some of the visualization options of this. So we could decide that we don't want to use lines, we just want points. Um, so we can have points as, instead, we can make them smaller or larger, depending on how we want that to look. Uh, we can have bars instead, or we can have, like we had before, lines. I always like the lines option, but I also like to add some... Um, some coloring to this what i like to do is set it to hue and then i'll just make the you can see what happens there as i bring that up it's now bringing up um sort of a color to that and you can also say connect um null value so if, if i put that you can see that there's some there's a bit of a gap in the data there when i sort of stopped and started the script uh, so if i say always connect null values it kind of smooths them out so you've got that nice smooth thing if i zoom in a bit more on some of these you can see now it's looking a bit more sensical and they're quite sharp them so if i change that i can make them more rounded i can make them choppier like so um, and you can change like the line width depending on how you want that to look you could have it so there's no line widths it's just these nice shapes uh, and you can basically play around with that you can have uh, dotted lines dots however you want this to look um, so really like how you can make this work and you can add in extra labels as well so uh, let's have a look what this would be. Is that time? No, that's soil um, moisture percentage like so. And that's just added that little um, axis thing there. And you can set the minimum and maximum values of these as well. You can also turn off it. I don't know if you can see this. There's like very slight grid lines. If you zoom in on the, the stream, you'll see that these grid lines, we can turn those off or we can have them on depending on how you want this to look. And you can make the scale like logarithmic or linear as well, depending on uh, what it is you're measuring. You can also define minimum and maximum values. So for example, if we were only interested in things that were um, between 20 and 80 we can sort of chop the data like that we can also make it more extreme so if the minimum was like minus 10 we can do that and it'll add that extra level in and if the maximum was say 200 you can see that sort of drop down so we can set the minimum and maximum if you don't provide any it'll read the data and it'll just guess what that is um, so that's nice and simple and then there's also like a display name you can put on there as well uh, for this so we can just call this moisture soil moisture something like that and you can even change the color scheme depending on how you want this to look and go for that rather funky looking thing there and then there's our first panel so we can resize this and then we can we can add another panel in there so uh, let's click on this little add panel button <clears throat> and you can actually move these around um, however you want you can create a row that's got several panels within it or you can have a look at their panel gallery and uh, add further ones but we just go in here and very quickly grab some other data so i can hear it's raining outside so i'm interested to know um, if we can uh, get some of that data so here are all the different let's go for robot lab outdoor let's see if there is a uh, rain like so and let me see the fact it's not brought any data up right away means it's probably not got anything to show me just now uh, we can have a look over the past 24 hours no so that that particular one isn't very good let's try rain total nope what i'm going to do is get rid of that so let's uh, remove that filter there we go so let's so that's the rain total and do we think that makes sense as a as a visualization Maybe we would want some dots for this, but we can have like rain level. Okay, so we can have that next to there as well. 
I didn't give that a name, <clears throat> so I can quickly go back in there and just uh, change that. And that's the alias there, so this is rain level. And maybe we want to have like the uh, the wind speed as well, so we can just go and click on that panel. We can add in another panel. We can go to here, go to the weather. Let's find the, uh, the field, which is, uh, was it wind, wind speed? There we go, we've got some data there. Let's just call this one wind speed. And <clears throat> let's have a look what else we've got. So up here we've got time series data. There's lots of other options we can have in here, such as like a gauge. So that's currently showing whatever the wind speed currently is. Uh, we can have bar charts. We can have tabular data if we want that. So we can see what the actual readings are. So it's, and this is kind of how, this is how I imagine it stores it internally anyway, but um, time series data is stored in time order. So that's how it's easily, um, it can easily slice the data because it's stored in that sort of sequence. So it knows once it's gone back a certain amount, um, there's no more data to be had beyond that point. Um, so that's the, uh, the different types of things we have. We've got pie charts, we've got state timeline, we've got heat maps. That looks quite funky, let's keep that. Uh, let's just apply that and then we can sort of decide how we want to arrange these so you can you can move them around like so to make them all sort of the same size and you can see also just how easy it is to sort of update and move this about so I can make that a bit larger as well and then once you've decided on um, your layout you can basically just save this as uh, let's call this one live stream dashboard like so so that's now saved and I can go on my mobile phone and I can see this um, this data um, just by connecting to that that same um, IP address and then basically just um, navigating to that live stream dashboard and on the mobile view it gets the panels and it kind of lines them up a bit like a mobile view um, of a website as you would expect it's a responsive design is what I'm trying to say there so yeah, that's how you um, you can build a dashboard very easily from your Internet of Things data using Grafana. I absolutely love Grafana. I use it for all my projects whenever data visualization is concerned. Now, there are alternatives to things like Grafana. You can use things like the um, Adafruit. They have their, uh, is it called Connected Cloud? I can't remember what their the current name for that is, but they have something very similar where you can create charts and get your internet of things data and they kind of bundle all those different components together uh, like i was just showing you like the mqtt broker the uh, the node red to manipulate your data as it comes in the database to store it in like influxdb and then the visualization and alerting tool like grafana okay let's get back over to our slides so we are going to check out the uh, kevsrobot.com slash learn slash which is the uh, the learning platform that i put together and i've uh, included a few more things on there about how to build SMARS robots. I think there's two additional courses uh, on there as well as the how to learn MicroPython, the Robotics 101 and the Learn ROS with me. And this is the I mechanism one that I need to sort of update and finish off. There's a few bits missing from that. But yeah, check out kevsrobot.com slash learn. Oh, so we've, we've built the dashboard. We've, <laughs> we've done that bit. Um, if you've not already joined me on Discord, you might want to consider going to uh, our Discord server to so get the link for that. It's a uh, casualbot.com slash discord and you can get the sign up link there. And I think it also asks you for your email address and that's just for our newsletter, which I need to send out Alex at the end of this show because I've not done it again. So it's fine. This, we just need to add two things to that, but that's all cool. Um, then we have the social media links. So I do post to all these different social media things. They all have their own nuances as well. So uh, on TikTok, I do little video clips of whatever projects I'm working on. So um, I'll just do a little uh, vertical video for that with a bit of music. Maybe that's a robotic voice that everybody seems to hate so much on there. Uh, but then people do like it. <laughs> so that's Kevin McAleer 6. I then do Instagram. So I do posts and reels on there as well. Similar to the TikTok ones. In fact, sometimes I cross post them. And then we have tick, uh, we have Twitter, which is that main place I will hang out. Um, and then we have uh, Kev's Mac at Mastodon.social, which is the Mastodon version as well. So if you're not following me on those different places, help me grow on all those different channels and help spread the robotic goodness. <laughs> Um, what else have we got? And if you want to help the channel, you can do that in a number of different ways as well. So you can do a super thanks. You can do a super chat if you're chatting now in the uh, um, in the live. Let me make sure everything is switched on from the... Uh, there we go. And we've got that little 
buy me a coffee thing as well which covers up my logo uh if you want to buy me a coffee like a physical coffee you can go to kevsrobots.com slash coffee and there's a, a link to buymeacoffee.com to do exactly that and you can also join the youtube membership program as well um i think that's just underneath the youtube main screen there's a little button there to join after you've subscribed i think that is so uh, thank you everybody who's already done that and i shall give you a special shout out now as well let me just uh go down here so I've got a, a new computer under my desk here, which is the uh, Mac Mini. And it has this weird feature where you can actually scroll onto the screen of the other computer just by moving your mouse about. It's really disconcerting because I haven't actually connected that up. Um, it's just there. And sometimes when I move my mouse about, it just appears on the other screen. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, right. So let me just click on that and we can progress to our next one. So, yes, supporters. <clears throat> So yes, thank you to everybody that supported the show so far. We've got our um, usual lineup of uh, people who've been really generous. So Roland uh, very generously donated. It was more than just two, actually. Was it about four coffees, I think, Roland, you bought, which is very, very generous. Thank you very much for that. We've got Marcus, we've got uh, Braun SL, we've got Carol. And then um, we have some members of the Buy Me A Coffee membership program, which is John, Tom, Keith, Shemi and Steve. And then the YouTube members, we have uh, Jose, we have Dale, we have Skipper Banks, we've got Sadiq, Jeff, uh, we have WP Body, we've got Bill, we have Hans from Chairlights, Michael, Fraser, Jean-Paul, and of course, Tom. So thank you, everybody who did that. And if you want to join it and have these uh, your name on the credits, just go to kevsrobots.com slash credits. I've got really clever with these uh, uh, <laughs> shortcuts and how to do redirection. That was something I learned a little while ago. So yes, I think it's everything I've got for you today. So yeah, I, uh, I did a little video before this. I was trying something, a new approach to doing these videos. Um, so... I basically recorded a video. It took me all week to record little bits of it and put it together. And it's all about how to build this self-watering plant system using this. It was first the Enviro Grow, but then I had to, um, I killed this one. Uh, it, it drowned. I basically left that little USB connector underneath the water line in the tray that it was in. And it basically just shorted itself out and it's dead now and it doesn't work. But I, I ordered another one because I love those so much. And yeah, I designed these little pots. The first iteration of the pot was a little bit too small. And uh, what happened was that sensor, which you can just see like so, um, it wasn't deep enough in the soil. So that's the very top level of the soil there. And the actual level of the soil from the pellet was way down. So there was probably like less than 10% of this sensor actually in the soil, reading the soil humidity. So it kept going up, oh, you dry, you need more water and kept pumping water. These work very effectively from the tube, a bit too effectively. And in the very bottom of this, there's some sort of drainage holes as well. You just see on the bottom there, the drainage holes. So I did a larger version, printed this larger version and this works really well. It's heavy, it's got like wider feet so that it stays very stable. And the, uh, the sensor is now completely under the soil. So that works well. And also the other thing is on these ones, the, the water inlet was in the side. And that meant that after it pumped water in and because the water level is lower to stop that siphoning effect, um, it would actually pull the water back and any soil that was loose would also come down the tube, which isn't great. So on this newer version, you can see that the water inlet is actually higher up. So it's pointing down at the top of the soil rather than underneath. So I absolutely love these. These are really nice design, really fun to do in Fusion 360. Uh, it only takes a couple of steps to do them as well. So uh, they're really nice. You can grab those um, over on uh, kesrobot.com. There's a, let me bring it up. There's a, a blog article that I wrote um, just about that. So let me just uh, bring that up. I can show you that just over here. So I go, scroll down you can see the two videos what we're just doing now and then there you go build a self-watering plant system so you can go on there and grab the uh, the files so there we go wait for that to load up there we go so there's the the video there's the um, bill of materials the 3d design and then the actual files themselves so you can grab those for free you can also grab the uh, the pie stand which is the the stand that I created for the uh, grow hat and the Raspberry Pi Zero, they look like this. And uh, yeah, I did a video about those using the air quality sensor. But yeah, that's the lineup. So we have a Pico one, a Zero one and a full size Raspberry Pi one. They work really well. I'm really pleased with how they came out. 
So this is the point in the video where I'll say thank you so much for watching and I shall see you next time. And for people watching live, we can, uh, we can have a bit of a Q&A. So let me have a look what people have been talking about. So Shemi was talking about the uh, when I was dropping things. I didn't drop it. It was uh, gravity just assisting me, wasn't it? <laughs> I only dropped one thing so far. <laughs> Look a bit shocked there. I've deleted the email. Have you? Oh, it's all right. I'll I'll find it. We might be able to undelete it. Uh, what else have we got? So they were saying I had a cog keyboard for a while many years ago. I missed that keyboard. I had a cog poly. I but I we had one at, um, when I was at school. In high school, they had a cog poly, this great big thing, and it had this little joystick on the end, and you could change like the the phase or the um, the uh, the pitch just by pitch bending. It was trendy in the eighties, and I loved that keyboard. And then many years later, when I was um, uh, I just finished being a student, I thought I want to buy a cog poly and have one because I just wanted one so much. And there's like a famous music store on Oxford Road in Manchester, um, and they had one. So and it was actually quite affordable. So I grabbed that. It needed a bit of repair. Uh, I think some of the pots on the joystick. There's basically just two pots, like a left and a right. They just needed um, cleaning up, and yeah, it worked fine. I had that for quite a while. I love that keyboard. So Vince says, "Evening from Colchester." Even Vince, how are you doing? Uh, so Dale says, um, "I'm starting to work through my tiny ML cookbook with uh, Jan Marco Lodis." Yeah, interesting. <laughs> if I had the pants, I'd build my own. If it's pants, I'll build my own. Is that if you had pants, you'd build your own. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Honestly, it's it's um, these are a great product. I just misused it. I basically just had it sat in the water. I mean, what was I thinking? How did I not know that that would eventually happen? The reason I like these is because they're battery powered as well. They're really small. They've got that Pico and they've got all the connectors and everything you need and all the temperature sensors in a tiny little board. So I really like them. I'm really disappointed that I killed it. Um, <laughs> our robot's complaining that I do need to let that go actually at some point. Um, so Vince says, really cool, um, I already have an MQTT broker on a Raspberry Pi. Awesome, me too. <laughs> InfluxDB is, I've never been able to get running, so paying much attention. Um, I found it quite straightforward to set up, if I remember. I can actually bring up, well, while we're looking, let me just go over to um, uh, GitHub. Me and then Clustered Pi. And then let me find you what we are looking at. In fact, that might have been, let me go over here. Right, so over here, this if you go to um, github.com slash kevmacalea slash clustered pie, there's a playbooks um, folder in there, and I've got all my, um, oops, all the different scripts I have. So you can see there's one for Grafana, there's one for InfluxDB, and that's how it installs Influx. <laughs> it's as simple as um, basically run that command there, which will say docker run, put, <coughs> put 8086, 8086, 8086, 83 8083 and then use the volume so basically just create a local um folder influx uh, db slash and that means map influx db to var lib influx db and then install influx db 1.8 so that's the version i've installed on there ignore is ignore errors equals yes that's how easy it is so that script there um is what ansible will basically use um, so I've got one for all the different components that I use on here. So it's one for Grafana as well. So I'll look at that. So that one, Docker run, name Grafana, port 3000, volume is Grafana storage, maps are there, and then just install Grafana slash Grafana. It couldn't be easier. So you can just run those commands directly, just that Docker command. You can basically just ignore the rest. The rest is for Ansible. And these are all Ansible cookbooks or playbooks. So yeah, it's as easy as that. <laughs> uh, what else we got on here? So Rich says, um, I won't spoil, I won't spoil it, but started building. Oh, cool. Um, did you get rid of that thing, by the way, on Twitch? There's a thing that pop, I don't know if it, it doesn't, it, it might not pop up to you, but um, I get to see that. Uh, sorry, nobody else, does it? nobody else watches on Twitch. <laughs> I don't think I stream to Twitch, and I don't think anybody else actually watches there. So can Grafana work with any other data storage systems? Absolutely. So I think there's pretty much a plugin for every type of database. So have you got a specific one in mind? We can probably find the answer to that very quickly. Uh, Tim says, I've got some ESP32 and a camera and several IP cameras spare in the shed. You know, you know what you've got to do with them. You've got to set them up. <laughs> um, so what else have we got on here? Da, da, da. 
Um, not so. a mod on Twitch. Hmm? Not a mod on Twitch. You're not. I'll have to make you a mod on Twitch, that's odd. Um, so, I'm trying to install um, Node-RED on my Pi 400 and it says I've broken dependencies, I don't understand what it's talking about. So th there is a, there's a known thing with that. The original Raspberry Pis, they came with Node-RED installed and essentially what you want to do is uninstall that and install it from, from scratch. Um, I think I have a script for that, so that's Node-RED. Let me just find my Node-RED one. So again, in my playbooks, so what I do on here... I basically stop Node-RED, I remove Node-RED, and then I build it by using this uh, run Node-RED port 1AAO, which is the regular port for it, and then connect the volume Node-RED data to data, and then just pull down Node-RED slash Node-RED, and that's it. So that command there should get you up and running with uh, Node-RED in a Docker container anyway. So that's how easy it should be. I store everything in code like this because I can't remember how I installed things months, years ago. And if it's in code, it's it's reusable and I can reread it and understand how I did this. So there you go. So can Grafana handle video feeds? Well, it graphs raw data, like tabular data. So what I don't think you could do that. I might be wrong. You might be able to have a panel that punches out to a video feed. But it the time series data has to be like integers floats that kind of like database type data if that's what you're talking about um what else we've got so roller says it's a uh, 16.8 uh, degrees in um in the living room oh that's a bit cold for your living room is it uh my my living room is 25 so yeah six sixteen point eight. 16.8 i think was what it was at the time when um when i took that reading which is pretty cool um i think we like it a bit cooler in our house uh, what else we've got on here? Da, da, da. <laughs> Tim says, nothing wrong with that temperature. So everybody's, honestly, this is why I enjoy working from home and not in an office, because you don't have these sort of temperature wars that you have. Do you get that in your lab, or do the labs define what temperature it needs to be? It has to be 25 degrees. It has to be 25 degrees. Um, it's quite warm, that. We get told off if it goes up or down. Really? Yeah. Alex works in a cell culture lab, so they have to have a very specific temperature. Hey, Keith, how is it? how's it going? Um, what else? So you've just installed Mosquito. That's a really good uh, MQTT broker. Yep, that's a good one. I use... Um, I don't use Mosquito. I use something else, I think. Or maybe it is Mosquito. I can't remember now. It's been that long ago since I installed it. It's another Docker thing. I could find it. <laughs> so Tim says, my DOS was Yamaha keyboard. It's almost left... <laughs> it almost left the window several times this week. <laughs> wow. So is that using Ansible? Yes. Yeah, so I, I created those scripts um, to install things with Ansible. It's it's one of those things you can learn in about an hour, Ansible. It's really, really powerful. And there's many things built into it. And there's also like downloadable, um, do they call it the universe, Docker universe, Docker galaxy? There's, there's like a whole load of extensions. And it's written in Python, so obviously it's really nice. Um, have you added an SSD to a Raspberry Pi? Yes, I have one. The, that Raspberry Pi just at the back, just there, has an SSD plugged into it. What I did have to do, I did have to um, get a very specific um, cable uh, because not all USB to SATA connector things are supported. So if you, I think Pi Hut do them, I think Pimroni do them as well, but there's like a SATA to USB connector that you'll need to get. Um, and that is the thing that will make it work or not work. Yeah. Dale says uh, his Pi 400 boots from a 512 gig USB drive. Cool, cool. So, yeah, that's everything I've got for you this week. I um, really like hanging out. What do you think of the new format by doing like a, a pre-recorded video and then a sort of a, a live stream afterwards? Does that still work for you guys? <laughs> I'm uh, wanting to do more pre-recorded stuff um, because I was told by somebody who's very uh, knowledgeable about YouTube, they're a YouTube Academy person, that uh, just doing live streams and particularly the length of live streams that I do because they're in depth, that's hurting my channel growth. and I don't want that to happen. I want my channel to grow in the way that it should do. So I need to do a few more pre-recorded, more polished videos um, as well as the live streams as well because it's all about the community, isn't it? Great stuff. So um, if there's nothing, if there's no more comments, I'll uh, leave it there and um, yeah, we can speak next time. So thank you so much for watching and I shall see you all next time. Bye for now.